Okay, it's time. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. This is Cherry Kubota. I'm a professor at the Ohio State University. Welcome to uh, Indoor Ag Science Cafe September. Gosh, it's getting close to the end of the year. I can't believe. Um, I hope you are doing well. This is a uh, uh, outreach activities funded by USDA, NIFA, um, participating universities, uh, Michigan State University, Ohio State University, Purdue University, University of Arizona. Um, original idea is uh, advancing CEA, particularly indoor farming area or sector um, forward, but. Most likely starting next year, um, we will be um, including much wider. Um, yeah, so idea is to advance CEA. And then the next year, we might expand a little bit, you know, the target areas, not just indoor vertical farm, but a little bit more wider CEA. Um, because the, um, because of the, I think, the, the need also coming from that sector. But anyway, uh, Quick um, update of the schedule. Um, today is Delphi. Uh, Dr. Uh, Laura Bautista is going to give a talk about vertical farming strawberries and um, other fruit crops. And then next month, we're going to have a um, showcase. Uh, we have been doing a um, showcase series uh, um, several times. Um, and then this is uh, one of them, and then three companies are giving three companies are giving short presentations. And then we have another strawberry talk, but this is more like a pharmaceutical application. So a Japanese researcher um, is going to give a talk. And then December we are still discussing, and then beyond that we are still dis discussing um, the potential speakers. If you have a recommendation, I'd like to hear too. Um, so, um, Optimia Group also developing uh, Optimia University uh, educational contents, and it's a wide range of topics. And then we have, um, well, this is something you can always, you know, access and watch and use that for internal education or your uh, own education learning. Um, we have uh, uh, several new additions. Um, Number one is a VOC, phytotoxicity. If you don't have a problem, you are lucky. If you have a problem, it's really hard to solve. So that so that's we added. Uh, actually, I talked about that. And then the uh, very basic information, but it's good to have that. Uh, let us how to grow lettuce in an uh, indoor vertical farm setting under artificial lighting. And then three um, economics topics, um, uh, planning production efficiency, OPEX, uh, fixed and variable costs, and uh, labor efficiency. So the um, three economics talks um, led by um, Dr. Simone uh, Valle de Sousa, uh, Michigan State, uh, doing that. And then let us talk is by uh, Eric Ranko and his graduate student. So those are the new additions. All right. So with that, I would like to um, have Dr. Laura in in this uh, presentation um talking about strawberries and fruiting other fruit crops for vertical farming all right so i stop um sharing and then have lola present okay thanks thanks a lot for the invitation cherry it was a uh, it's a pleasure to to be here and share um uh, what we have been doing in delphi uh, we have been for the last three years working on, on fruit crops and specifically in strawberries because there was a high demand in the sector for knowledge. And well, you're going to see through this presentation uh, the complexity of growing strawberries, especially in indoor uh, systems. So, but before that, um, not sure if everybody is familiar with uh the Delphi and the Improvement Center, that's uh, where, where we are based. The Delphi Improvement Center is a research and demonstration center from Delphi and is based in the Netherlands. Uh, Delphi is a large consultancy company, uh, also based in the Netherlands, but working uh, internationally. And our focus is crop production and agricultural systems. So uh, Delphi, uh, as a company, it uh, works on advising and providing consultancy for different aspects related with crop production and, and, agricultural, and agricultural systems from open field to high-tech greenhouses. 
And then we have several research cent research centers where we do uh, more uh, practical research and demonstration of cultivation concepts, uh, new techniques, uh, new technologies. Um, the Delphi Improvement Center is focused on control environment and agriculture. So we have from high tech uh, greenhouse facilities that you can see in the pictures to also the, the vertical or the indoor farms. So in this presentation, I'm going to say vertical farming, but uh, I, I, I want to refer in general to indoor farming. It doesn't have to be always in vertical layers. It could be just just the, the full effect of growing in a fully uh, controlled environment using artificial light. Uh, that's, the, that's the focus. Uh, and what, what do we do in vertical farming at Delphi? Uh, it's also along the same concept as the improvement center. So we do pretty uh, very practical research focus on understanding how can we grow crops in indoor farming settings, uh, of course, uh, for commercial purposes or, uh, or the other way around. I would also like to say the, the question in a different way or how can we use these systems to uh, support food or crop production? Because uh, maybe the system can also help part of the whole process of producing crops. And, and here you can see pictures of uh, some of our trials that we have been doing in our facilities. We have uh, three different types of facilities with different uh, growing systems and different dimensions and scale, and also designed by different suppliers. So we have the opportunity to explore a, a lot of things and uh, from different perspectives and on different crops. Um, apart from research, we also uh, provide consultancy or shared knowledge um, and, and anything related with cultivation of crops. So we support some companies through the entire process of growing crops in indoor farms uh, from just starting to even optimizing and improving yields. Uh, we also help uh, with the design of, of farms, making sure that the, 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 we provide the, the requirements of, uh, of the crop, the functional requirements, and that then the, the technical design is kind of uh, at maximum as possible is designed uh, to match those requirements uh, for the cultivation of the crop. Um, and also we provide training and education for uh, growers or anyone involved in, in vertical farming who wants to expand their knowledge. Um, but uh, jumping into the context, um, uh, I think a good uh, a good topic for today was to talk about how to grow fruit crops in indoor farming systems. Um, it's, it's it's a question that has been for a long time uh, around in the sector. Uh, what can we grow beyond leafies? Um, I think it's a really fair and important question. Uh, we see that there is a demand uh, worldwide of of the of Increasing, uh, there is an increasing consumption of fresh, uh, fresh, fresh fruit crop, uh, uh, crops. Um, also, an increasing demand uh, for higher quality, uh, more uh, fresher uh, uh, food. Um, and in the way that the current system has been structured, uh, we have been uh, locating food production in, in various, in, in few regions of the world where we have good. Uh, climate for farming, let's say, and then um, shipping uh, long distance fresh products to other areas where they cannot uh, produce crops. Um, and that work, uh, it works well, but uh, it also makes that the, the product has, uh, the, the shelf life of the product has been prioritized uh, over the quality and flavor in many cases. And then also Sometimes, even though uh, ship, long shipping, uh, we have good technology for long uh, distance shipping, still the quality of the product arriving to the customers is still not in the best uh, level. Um, so I think that's a great opportunity for CEA and also indoor farming to bring uh, uh, production closer to the consumers, especially in those areas where uh, it is difficult to do in a different way with a different system. Um, and I think also it's interesting for some fruit crops that they have a, a good architecture or shape to fit into the vertical farming concept, right? Of, of stacking multiple layers and, and fitting um, uh, crops um, in a small uh, space. Uh, and this is actually uh, really good for the case of strawberries. It's a small 
canopy crop that can be stuck in multiple layers um, in a in a room. Um, but this is not easy and probably uh, that's why the, the industry has been slow in developing in this direction. Um, there are many challenges, um, especially with strawberries. Um, I think the first challenge is what happened to all the new crops that we are trying to grow in uh, in completely uh, indoor settings. That we don't have uh, we don't have cultivation knowledge available. We have to start uh, sometimes from zero. Um, but uh, at least sometimes we can use also cultivation coming uh, cultivation knowledge coming from other systems like uh, high tech greenhouses, where they are already using in some cases supplementary uh, lightning. So that give that give us at least some uh, starting point of knowledge, uh, but we have to translate and, and, and put it entirely into uh, in, into a, a closed system. Where uh, I like to say that in, in indoor farming, we have to create the entire environment. Uh, so we need to do everything from climate to light, uh, fertigation, uh, substrate, uh, everything that the crop needs to grow optimally. I think also another challenge is that it's a very expensive farming system compared to, to the other ones. Uh, in some cases, probably is the most expensive, expensive way to grow and produce the crop. So we have to deal with a, a high initial cost uh, for setting up the farm, but also sometimes also high operational cost. So we have to figure out how to cover that with the production uh, of the crop. And, and then maximizing yields becomes really important and maximizing quality of the of the yield. It's also very important for achieving a good price and, and high value products. I think uh, in addition to that, uh, the case of strawberries is a good example of the, the, the crop physiology becomes more complex than the leafies. When we were growing leafies, it was all about growing roots and leaves. When we move into fruit crops, we have a much more complex uh, crop cycle where we have to grow also flowers and fruits, and we have to induce flowering, and we have to maintain both vegetative and generative growth and, and all of that uh, in a very long crop cycle, longer than the, fruit, the leafies. So it gets uh, more complicated in that way. Um, on top of that, it's like I said, longer crop cycle, lower harvest index. So you put a lot of energy into growing other, part, uh, other parts of the crop that you need before you can actually get the final product, the fruits. Um, and I think in the case of strawberries, planting material is a very important topic to discuss. Uh, it's very challenging, especially if we think about vertical farming as an all year round production system for strawberries. Uh, getting access all year round to planting material is a big challenge, especially in some areas, uh, because this is not like a leafy crop where you can buy seeds um, and you have access to seeds all year round uh, from many breeding companies. This uh, The whole system behind how to supply the planting material for strawberries is complicated. I, uh, varieties are protected. The propagation of the varieties are protected. So you have to figure out uh, which variety, which is your nursery or your propagator selling that variety and which uh, time of the year they have the plant material available because in some cases they is not full, uh, full year round available. Um, yeah, normally the planting material has been designed for open field and greenhouse production so that they follow a little bit that schedule. Although things are changing. So, um, for uh, all of this, make a little bit the, the 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 scenario in which we started thinking: How can we grow strawberries in indoor farming or vertical farming? Um, and like I said, uh, Delphi, we had uh, a lot of experience with uh, our consultants and our research centers that have been working on. Uh, strawberry cultivation in high-tech greenhouses. So that gave, gave us um, an, a good initial point, but there are uh, a lot of different uh, points that we needed to touch, um, especially, and this applies to any crop that you want to start growing uh, uh, for commercial purposes, right? So you have to think about varieties, you have to think about strategy of production. If you want to produce all year round, um, what type of strategies can you use? 
Uh, you have to think about climate light fertigation substrate, what type of substrate fits into the special requirements of in the farming. There is a, the substrate itself is a whole world. Um, and then you also need to add the digitalization because you need to make sure that the crop is responding the way you want the crop to respond, that the climate is performing the way you want to perform. And uh, of course, evaluate energy and light efficiency. It's expensive farm, uh, farming system. So you want to make sure that all the energy, all the input that you put is used by the crop and, and, and in, a, in the most optimal or efficient way as possible. Um, so that's that's where we all started. And and so we we so far we have been doing uh, uh, cultivation trials, I like to say, where we have tested different strategies or different concepts for producing strawberries uh, in indoor farming. And I think um, the first trial uh, or the, uh, one of the first trials that we did, um, it's uh, probably um, a very easy concept that comes from uh, Dutch glass house uh, strawberry production. Um, so this is the, what we call peak strategy. It's basically uh, a one crop and one flash of, of production. Um, and the whole concept, like I said, comes from uh, Dutch glass house production. So uh, glass, uh, the Dutch sector has been using this type of planting material to accelerate production. And, and 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 also reduce the cultivation period and also to have uh, even higher production levels with the way that they condition the plant material. So in this case, we use short uh, day varieties or Juneberry varieties um, that they have been conditioned uh, into from, with cold storage. And also they have been propagated uh, sometimes in open field or in a greenhouse and, and in the, during the propagation phase, they already induce uh, a number of trusses of flowers. So these plants are ready to be transplanted and in a few weeks start producing. Um, and because of the cold storage, the dormancy is also broken, which can be sometimes a problem for these type of varieties. And also the vigor energy of the of the plant is boosted. So it's a, it's a, it's a good approach. It's a good option. And um, like I said, this is a really short period. You get the plants, you transplant them. And in about six weeks uh, after transplanting, you can start picking uh, the first harvest. Um, so here you have some pictures at the bottom, the top one. It's uh, uh, one of the plants with uh, a few weeks after transplanting. You can see already the first uh, flower truss growing uh, from the crown. And in the bottom, you have a, a, a picture, like a bird view of our cultivation room. We are using uh, gutters, a gutter system. Um, in that sense, we are keeping it simple also for research purposes to access the plant and, and be more uh, easier for labor. Um, so we have eight gutters in this room where we have its fully closed uh, artificial environment with a light system on the top. Um, so what was the result for this strategy? Well, um, here you have a graph that summarizes uh, the harvest that we got for the four different varieties that we tested. Um, the black line is the average weekly harvest that we got uh, for each variety. And it's in kilograms per linear meter of gather. And then the blue bars indicate the cumulative harvest per week um, the, for each variety as well. Um, and then uh, you can see we had eight and uh, nine weeks of production. And, and for all the varieties, you clearly see the peak of in the yield. Uh, so you have uh, your, your weekly yield goes from really low at the beginning to really high levels uh, in the peak in the week peak, and then again, it goes low by the end of, uh, of the, the whole uh, corf, the whole period. Um, I think here, um, one of the main uh, outcomes that we saw, so it's 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 a good strategy to get a, a, a big amount of kilos. So you harvest a lot of strawberries in a short period of time, but you can have a big difference in harvest between different varieties. So the variety is really important. Uh, in the best performance, we were able to get between five and a half and seven and a half kilograms 
per linear meter of gutter in, in nine or 10 weeks. Um, and then in the worst performing ones, it can be four kilos below below that, which is a big difference. And, and on, the, on the left, you can see a picture of how the plants looked uh, during the, the production period. So it's fully loaded of, of fruits and flowers. But of course, the quality was it's also important and, and not only the kilos. So uh, we also evaluate uh, the type of quality that we get in the fruits. And for those of, uh, of, of you that are not familiar with uh, how the strawberry, uh, the quality of, the of strawberry fruits are classified, um, at least the way we are using in Europe, we have different classes. Um, class one, uh, it's uh, all the fruits that are intended for fresh market. And for that, the fruit size needs to be above 20, uh, 25 millimeters, the, the, di the diameter. And also uh, the, the fruit uh, needs to be in perfect condition, like no bruises uh, and, and the good level of ripening, uh, no major deformations um, and, and those type of, of things. So it's the typical fruit that you find when you go to the supermarket in, in the boxes. Um, and then you have class two, which is uh, anything that because of the size will be class one, but it has deformity or it has other issues that uh, cannot be sold in fresh markets, but can be used for industri industrial processing. And then waste is anything that is really, really, really small, like a small below 25 millimeters diameter of fruits or anything that is affected by diseases and pests and it cannot be used for anything. So uh, in our case, we wanted to have at least 70% of our weekly harvest uh, with fruits that, uh, that were in class one first and also with diameter above 20, 27 millimeters uh, uh, size. And then uh, if you look at the picture above, you have an example of, of, the, uh, of the size of the strawberries for one of the varieties and you can, they are organized in increasing order. So you can see the, the, the strawberries which have a, uh, which has a diameter above 27 millimeters um, in class one. Uh, so you can see that for all the varieties we achieved our target and it was very impressive that some of the varieties uh, for some weeks, especially at the beginning, uh, we got really high high proportion of the harvest uh, in within that category. So you you have a really nice quality of of fruits you can get a nice quality of fruits with this uh with this uh, uh, type of strategy as well and in terms of bricks uh also bricks levels were really good above 7 for all the varieties in the best performing one which is variety 3 and 4 uh the bricks level were uh, all weeks uh, between 8 and 10 um so that's uh, it's it, in general, it's a really good outcome for uh, growing strawberries indoors. And but uh, to be honest, there are um, there is like a dark side of this type of a strategy that you need to be aware of. And um, this strategy has a lot of requirements if you want to use it for all year round production of strawberries. And I think you can imagine that the first thing is the the amount of crops that you need to to use per year. So it's uh, you have to think about this as a really high throughput system in which you are going to do between three or even up to five crops per year because your your cultivation room is just a produ production room where you just introduce the crop, harvest for 10 weeks or nine weeks, and then replace it with another one. So it means that you need to have access full year round to uh, cold storage uh, tray plants or um, cold storage plant material uh, for these varieties, and that's difficult. If you if if you are if you are using uh, propagators, that's that's still a challenge. Uh, the other alternative is that you can control the entire production of plant material, but this is also difficult because varieties are protected with license, so only propagators can propagate them. So you need to figure out if you have access to any variety that is open access or you can buy a license to propagate. 
and then you, you then you have to take care of the whole process to prepare your tips, prepare your planting, you propagate them, cold storage, and then putting them in the cultivation room. And as you can imagine, this involves also a lot of labor, a lot of energy, and, and probably also high consumable inputs, like substrates if you're using substrate, but that's depend also on the, the growing system that you use. But that's that's the that's the the, the reality. Um, so, because of all these things, uh, we we started thinking if there were any other alternatives, um, if if it's possible to achieve a, a comparable yield in a different way, especially uh, if you don't have access to continuous supply of of new plants throughout the year. Can we grow the same with less number of crops, with one crop, with one and a half crops? Uh, at least you can have access in a specific moments of the year to those plants uh, from the propagators or uh, and, and 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 use them for a longer period. Um, and at the same the same time, um, you can imagine uh, if you're familiar also with the strawberries, uh, cultivating strawberries require also. Uh, a lot of cooling capacity in your system. You have to reach very low temperatures during the night period if you want to aim for good fruit quality and size. So we also wanted to test if it was possible to grow them uh, relatively uh, a bit warmer uh, temperature range than what uh, we usually do and what we did in the in the peak trial, uh, because uh, there could be cases in which uh, 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 there are systems that cannot reach. Uh, such a low temperatures or uh, you don't want to uh, spend all the energy in, in cooling down so much every night your 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 room so those are the 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 questions that put the setup for for another trial that we did and in this case uh, we wanted to try what we call the balance strategy this is also uh, there are also some trials uh, testing a much more balanced way of producing strawberries uh, in long term uh, in the greenhouses as well. Um, and, and the whole concept is to have uh, uh, one crop that can yield more stable weekly uh, harvest, level of harvest, and then you can keep the same crop for months uh, yielding. Um, in this case, uh, we used everbearing varieties uh, these varieties are popular for this type of a strategy. They perform uh, very well um, because of the way they get uh, the flowering uh, induction. Um, so for, for, for working in a strategy like that, we also needed to control the planting material. Uh, we needed to make sure that we prepare and condition the plant materials to later perform in this way. So we also did the propagation ourselves, starting from fresh tips. And you can see in the picture above uh, our small plants being propagated in the vertical farm. And in the picture below uh, the day that we did the transplanting into the cultivation room. Uh, for this strategy, we were aiming to have an average of uh, half a kilo half a kilogram of, of, of uh, class one strawberries per linear meter of gutter. And at least being able to harvest for, if possible, nine months. Um, we, Like I said, we wanted to test also if it, it was possible to grow and produce high quality strawberries uh, using um, less lower temperature night temperature. So we try to stay uh, around 16 Celsius degree minimum during the night, um, and, and that's that's the that was the whole setup for the for this trial. And actually, what we saw is um, that it was really difficult uh, to start. It was really difficult to achieve um, long term stable yield uh, weekly. Uh, so growing in balance it was very difficult using this strategy. You can see in this graph, uh, the uh, average weekly yield that we got for the different varieties. And, and two of those varieties more or less behave in a much more balanced way, like much more stable weekly yield, but the other two, the other two varieties um, 
tended to have a, a big flush of production. Um, so again, <laughs> varieties uh, are really important, and picking uh, the right variety for your for your strategy it's it's crucial. You can have uh, very different outcomes with different varieties. So in terms of yield, uh, it was still low for most of the weeks below the target that we set. So we set this target because we know from our greenhouse trials that this is uh, possible to achieve, uh, especially with ever varying varieties. Um, and and we uh, it's, it's a theoretical uh, potential that we have. And in the, in the greenhouse trials, they have been able to achieve for a long period uh, this level of yield. So that's what we are trying to uh, get here. Um, but uh, another issue that we've also faced, it was really uh, hard to keep the crop yielding for nine months. And actually after the first, after six months, our crop was totally exhausted. So when you grow at warmer temperatures, you accelerate all the processes of the crop everything goes faster, including flower induction. And then um, if you have a big flush of production, then normally the crop uh, have a hard time to recover. And, and at some point it's just stop all the growth and including the vegetative growth. Um, so yeah, that was the, the outcome. Um, in terms of cumulative harvest, you can see the, the values similar to the peak, but the difference is that it took 21 weeks of production to achieve that level of harvest. So difficult. In terms of quality, it was also really difficult to maintain a stable level of quality. And in fact, most of the weeks we struggled to have a decent quality of fruits. Most of the weeks, uh, for most of the weeks, also most of the harvest was uh, with the strawberries that were really small in size. Um, and in terms of bricks, uh, something similar. So there were two varieties that kind of gave, especially at the beginning, um, good levels of bricks. But then if you look at the fruit size was, uh, we were not at, at the level that we wanted. So most of the, most of the 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 harvest was also still in very small size fruits, um, so it was difficult to keep it stable as well, and we also some varieties did not manage to get bricks levels above seven, which is uh, the minimum threshold for most of the markets. And and then we have um, another trial. And this one is uh, very much exploratory. Uh, this is a trial that is actually uh, going on uh, at this moment. And, and again, we are still trying uh, to have a much more balanced uh, crop uh, with long-term production. Um, and in this case, we are exploring something a little bit out of the ordinary. So we are trying to to use to make jumber varieties with normally that normally behaves in peaks of production. So we're trying to grow them and produce strawberries in a similar way than a ever better in a much more long-term uh, crop with more stable uh, uh, yield per week and trying to prevent those flushes or those big peaks of production that later give, gives uh, a big gap of, of period without any production because the crop needs to recover and, and, and start flowering again. So that's the question, if, if we can grow this uh, short day varieties with long-term production, like an everywhere variety. Um, why trying this? Well, there are some markets that prefer or are used to Juneberry varieties. Um, so that's, uh, that's something that especially here in the Netherlands, we, we are very familiar with these varieties. We know how to grow them uh, for a long time. So that's an advantage. Uh, it's In general, the, 
we think they're easy to program for flowering because they're very obligate, short day, uh, short day to obligate. So we know where is the threshold and, and as long as you do the, the right conditions, you, you induce uh, flowering um, in that way. And there are also some varieties that don't need cold treatment for overcoming dormancy. And here is where the interesting part comes along. Um, so there are uh, what we call low chill varieties that doesn't require um, uh, a lot of accumulation of, of hours below certain temperatures to overcome dormancy. And these are varieties that come um, from southern, more southern and Mediterranean regions where they are growing strawberries. And these varieties has potential for a strategy like this because you can just uh, avoid the cold storage treatment that normally for a high chill variety, you can think about five weeks minimum into cold storage to meet the requirements of hours uh, with uh, cold temperatures. Um, the same as we did before, uh, getting, in con getting the control of the young plant material is really important for controlling the way they will behave later in the cultivation phase. So we also started from fresh tips and we did the propagation phase, providing the conditions that we wanted for them. Um, and, and, and then I think uh, what makes different from the previous trial is that we didn't put any limit in, on energy. So in this case, we are giving climate, light, and food period at optimum. Uh, and as we see that the crop needs it. Uh, so we are not thinking on that saving of uh, energy part and just trying to see what uh, was the maximum potential we can get from these crops. Uh, with the way we are growing. Um, the whole point of the strategy is to have the June bearers continuously uh, flowering like an ever bearer will do. And that's a big challenge uh, because like I said, they're obligate short day varieties. So they need short day conditions to continuously induce flowering. And here the challenge is to uh, provide enough energy to the plant in a short day so that the, the plant can make enough photosynthesis and produce enough assimilates to supply all the demand from the fruits. Uh, so normally uh, this, these varieties when they're grown in the glass houses for most of the production uh, flushes they are in long day conditions. So they have uh, many hours of photosynthesis and produ production of assimilates um, so that gave that a lot of energy for making nice, uh, good tasting fruits. Um, so here is how can we uh, keep the crop sensing that is a short day, but at the same time providing enough energy uh, similar to what they will experience in a long day for a simulate production. And like I said, it's still undergoing, so I don't have result uh, data to show, but I want to share some pictures of what we are experiencing. Is experiencing. Um, so here you see on the left side um, an ever better variety that we included for control purposes. And then on the right side, you have the June bearer varieties that we are testing. And we have a low chill variety June bearer on the left of the picture and a high chill variety on the right of the picture. So at this moment, our ever bearer variety, you can see uh, it's a picture for you to see an example of how it will be a, a balanced crop, uh, how it will look like. So you see flowers and fruits and canopy developing all at the same time. And you try to keep this behavior for long-term period, for months, if it's possible. And then um, in terms of fruit size, you can see uh, from the pictures, we are achieving really nice fruit sizes. Uh, some many fruits that are, are above uh, 35 millimeters diameter, which is surprisingly large. And then um, on, the, on the right side, you see the young bearers varieties or the short day varieties, which are much more complicated but the low chill variety, it's uh, it's now going a little bit in the right direction. 
Uh, we struggled a little bit to maintain the flower induction with some light treatments that we were testing uh, to provide more energy to the crop. And now we are, it seems that we're finding the balance between maintaining short day conditions, but enough uh, photosynthesis or, or light to the crop. And the problem is the high chill variety. If you look at on the right side, you see that the crop is going into dormancy. So that is going to be uh, difficult to, to break. Um, but that's uh, at the, uh, currently the moment. So I just want to summarize a little bit uh, after all I share with you. Um, I think if you if you quickly look at this table, you have a brief summary of what we have achieved with the different strategies. You clearly see that peak strategy so far is giving the highest yield. Um, also in terms of class one, it's a surprisingly good yield and good quality um, and in a very short period of time. But the reason for what we are trying so hard to test uh, other ways, including like more, more, much more balanced uh, strategy with uh, less amount of crops per year is because we see the potential. If we look at the, the theoretical potential that we believe we can achieve, uh, then, th then the scenario is different. In this table, I compare uh, how uh, one year production will look like if you use a peak uh, strategy with the June bearer varieties or a much more balanced strategy with ever better or if, if it's possible, June bearer variety. And you can think about a whole year production, so 52 weeks of, pro of cultivation. And from that, you have to count remove the weeks in which you need to grow and produce the flowers. So that will give you around 30 weeks for peak strategy only for production and 40 weeks uh, in the case of balance. Um, if we estimate that we have an average week, uh, weekly yield of class one, like we have been uh, measuring for the peak, there you have the number, but in the balance, we see that we can achieve theoretically 0.5 Kilogram, kilograms per linear meter of gutter. And then you see the number of crops per year that you can, you need to use for these strategies. And here is when it becomes interesting in potential annual yield. We, you can see that for, with both strategies, you can achieve something comparable. It's just that with the balance, you, you, you will use a lower number of crops per year. Um, and in terms of uh, energy and light use efficiency, also both uh, both uh, strategies becomes uh, very, very competitive and comparable. And I think the labor is a big a part of this. And, and you have to remember peak will include also a high amount of labor while balanced uh, strategy we think it requires uh, much, uh, much more less labor than a peak strategy, especially from our experience. Um, so all of this in the end will make your cost of production together with other things that we're not including here. But it's just uh, to give you an idea of why we think that this could have some potential and why we're still trying to figure out. Um, but yeah, we are still there trying to figure out many of those questions. And um, so I just... I just wanted to say that so far, uh, the major learnings that we have had, um, like I said, peak strategy uh, provides um, high yields, but it's also a very high throughput pipeline. And you need to get ready for that if you want to use it and potentially also involves higher cost of production. Um, the balanced long-term yield strategy that we are trying and also uh, in the Dutch in the Dutch glass uh, houses uh, production, they're also trying to to test this strategy for 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 producing uh, some of the, the Netherlands strawberries. It has potential, but it's still challenging. We still need to figure out a lot of things, especially how to maintain uh, flower induction or how to control much better and more precisely flower induction. Um, and also how can we control sink and source balances to be able to control better the, the quality and the sizes of the fruit. Uh, we still have uh, a lot of gaps in, in the knowledge behind of all in the mechanisms behind of all of this. Um, we also saw that if you grow at, at 24 hours temperatures above 16 Celsius, you can save energy, but then your fruits yield and quality suffer. Uh, so probably not a good idea for commercially uh, commercial purposes, 
And keep in mind that energy consumption for producing strawberries is higher than leafies uh, because of the energy, the temperatures that you need to uh, achieve during the production. Um, so you need to increase the efficiency of all matters. And that's why we think that the cultivation should focus on optimizing the plant processes, photosynthesis, transpiration, stomata of doctrines, uh, and the status of the crop. You have to grow from the crop perspective, and for that you need sensors and you need technology to monitor how the crop is responding in the plant. Uh, plant material, does, uh, you need to select the best performing varieties, but keep in mind that getting access to plant material is also difficult. So you need to figure out all of that before to before you jump into commercial production because it can be a really, really challenge to get whenever you want the type of plant material that you need. And um, I didn't touch a lot about this in this presentation, but um, also another thing that we have been learning and getting more uh, knowledge and we would like to keep exploring even more is, is light. Uh, we have seen that the light strategy, the way you provide light to the crop throughout the day, and the spectrum um, give you a lot of improvements into the growth of the crop, the efficiency of the cultivation, um, the type of quality you can achieve in the fruits, in the flavor, and the aroma, but also in the activity of the organisms if you use biocontrol, if you use pollinators. Uh, so definitely this is something that plays a, a very critical role in your whole cultivation. And we are still in the beginning of understanding how can we play more with the lightning to achieve better uh, and higher uh, uh, outcomes. And before I finish, um, I would like to say that what I shared today is, 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 a, is, is truly teamwork. There has been a lot of people involved in this project from the beginning, um, especially from the Delphi, Delphi side. Uh, so we have uh, our people directly involved in vertical farming research and cultivation management of the, vertic of the uh, trials in the vertical farms, but also our crop experts, our uh, previous team members who also contributed to many of these trials and our colleagues working in the greenhouses uh, for strawberry research as well. And the funding has been provided by uh, the Netherlands, the Dutch sector, uh, top sector. It's a public funded project, but there is a consortium of companies that you can see here also as well, uh, providing support and involved actively in this project. That was all. Amazing. Thank you. I, I really appreciate.